Welcome back, new and old loony listeners, to another episode of Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Connor. And I'm your other host, Ray. And uh, this episode, we'll be looking at Moon Knight issue 13, which is part four or five of Death and Rebirth. Uh, sorry, Death and Birth. Uh, we'll also be looking at um, a classic run issue with uh, a Black Panther, issue 22, Nightmare. So grab your issues, sit back, relax, and get your conchu on. Yes, welcome back, listeners, new and old. This is uh, this is the one and only, uh, the greatest, the most amazing, the death-defying Moon Knight podcast. Uh, it's a uh, start off. It's kind of a slow. It's a bit of a slow burner this week when it comes to news. But uh, we've got a few things lined up. But uh, when it comes to no news, we've really only got ourselves left to talk about. So Ray, what's been filling up your week this week? Oh well, um, yeah, just been um. I'm pretty busy with uh we're we're in the middle or the middle of a move so a lot of uh box pack box packing um today and over the last few days so uh it's actually quite good to to sit back um and chill out for a bit and you know and and talk on this podcast about moon night it's the first kind of chance I've had to kind of relax so yeah I'm stoked for it now how about yourself yeah um i have had nowhere near the the busy week but uh it's yeah it's not been a bad one i've been looking out for the moon knight funko pops on ebay which have dropped which are ridiculously Man. expensive might i oh, say gosh, aren't they if any of you yeah. are lucky enough to pick them up uh i've started uh reviewing over um bigcomicpage.com i suppose that's taken up a bit of my time this week started up there but apart from that i'm a oh pretty 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 yeah <laughs> I don't know where I was what's going with that. I'm so the... sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, what's uh, what's happening with the comic book review? You were saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose it's a bit of a plug, but just sort of hope it's not too in your face. Um, yeah, there's a site called BigComicPage.com. It's a it's a great little site. All uh, all a bit of fun reviews, and yeah, I've started up there. So you can find me talking about everything that isn't quite Moon Knight over there. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I'm sure we'll put this in the um the show notes loonies as well, so definitely check it out at uh uh I guess it covers all publishers, is that right, Connor? Yep, yep. Great. Great. So I mean, you know, our little fish pond here of Moon Knight is um um you know, just a a small bit of uh of Connor's vast knowledge of comics. So uh yeah, I'm I'm gonna look forward to, to reading some of your reviews. Thanks, man. Uh, did you get around to seeing Ragnarok this week? Was there any uh, Space Knight oh, moon did. copters flying around the sky with Space Wolves <laughs> on uh, Sakaar? No, unfortunately not. I was looking for um, I was looking for the other void, any floating <laughs> pyramids or any... Uh, no, no references to that, which was unfortunate, but the movie was, was grand. I mean, um, have you, are you yet to see it, Connor, or have you seen it? Yeah, I'll probably have seen it by our uh, next recording, but I sadly haven't gone in ah. just yet. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, definitely no spoilers, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is a real fun romp. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's getting positive reviews, um, you know, on Rotten Tomatoes and all that. But, um, yeah, it's definitely something to look forward to. Yeah, and I suppose uh, we got the uh, Punisher coming up soon, but uh, hopefully... We'll have our, our Moon Knight boy in that, which I suppose leads us into our, our first <laughs> bit of news this week when it yes. comes to a, a particular range of a, uh, what would you call them, merchandise memorabilia called um, Mini Mates? Mm-hmm. Mini Mates, yeah. Um, so what happened here? They released a few uh, few figures, right? Um, and, and they've released the, like, the Defenders figures, so you got Daredevil and... Um, Luke Cage and such, uh, but there was also another release, wasn't there, with uh, with a Punisher um, partnered with. I, I guess look, I don't I don't collect many mates, so I'm not too sure, but they come in packs of two, right? Um, yeah, packs and, of two for uh, ten USD each. Right, right, and uh, the Punisher one, which uh, will obviously be popular 
because of the Netflix show coming out, was partnered with a Moon Knight figure. Yeah, it's super so, exciting, um, and uh, possibly leads to more speculation, but uh, possibly yeah. not. <laughs> they were, immediately, I thought, what could that mean? What could that, you know, you know how like toys have, um, uh, you know, synonymous with kind of giving away um, things which they don't necessarily, or well, they, they shouldn't. Uh, I think we mentioned a while ago um, the Lego, Lego figures um, tended to do that, spoiled... Uh, you know, things that happened in the movie. Um, yeah, could this possibly be the same thing with the Minimates? Is it like a little nod that perhaps there's a Moon Knight appearance in the Punisher show? Pfft, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, so take it as you want, as you want. but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and I guess uh, the other bit of news... Um, that we had only a small bit. Uh, we're a bit we're a bit light on news this week, loonies. Um, but uh, the Funko Pop um, figures, which we announced uh, not long ago, uh, which there's a glow in the dark uh, LA exclusive, um, LA Comic Con exclusive. Um, that turns out to be two versions of the glow in the dark uh, Moon Knight. So apparently there's a there's one that glows like blue and the other that, that glows green. Uh and there was a picture of it posted up by um Moonlight Life on Instagram, um who also happens to be a loony um as well. And uh yeah, apparently I think it's uh the green one is is harder to get than the blue. So you know, if you're an avid collector, um and it's hard enough getting in the glow in the dark. Well, you've got one step further to go, and uh, you've got to try and find yourself a blue and a green one. Are you going to be going for both of them, Connor? I mean, if I if, uh, <laughs> if they maybe lower their price a bit, I might go in. But uh, interesting, actually. Um, the the first press releases we got for these Funko Pops uh, sort of indicated that they'd be on the Hot Topic website. Um, mm. but there's no actual listing for the Moon Knight Funko Pop, so I'm not sure if anyone's been in store to a Hot Topic and found a, found one of the Funko Pops in there, but it seems, uh, right. for what the first initial press release has said, they're, I don't think they're actually in stores yet. Yeah, I think you're right, because I actually was reading, um, the thread on that Instagram, and there was a conversation happening between collectors, and I think apparently Hot Topic um, were pushing it back to be released uh, Monday, the 30th of October. So um, that surprised me as well because I, I had a look on the... Um, what date is it now? It's the 29th, isn't it? I had a look on the... Like yesterday um, on the Hot Topic website to see if I can find... I couldn't find them as well. So apparently they're pushing them back for a Monday release. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm on there right now, and I'm not finding them, so possibly by the time not this goes yet. up, you might have them on there. Yeah, I guess uh, for those loonies who are keen on, on ordering, um, yeah, just uh, refresh that Hot Topic page, um, you know, uh, Monday onwards, and, and hopefully we get something. Um, you can also get them on eBay, I guess, but they go for, you know, they go for an arm and a leg there. Um, so... If you can find them in store or, or, you know, order them through Hot Topic. And for those who aren't in, in the US, um, if it's uh, not over the top with postage, um, <laughs> yeah, you could get yourself a, a decent priced um, Funko Pop Mr. Knight. I'm definitely keen on getting one. How about yourself, Connor? Oh, I mean, I'm so keen I'd be willing to get the three, uh, depending on <laughs> depending on my price range. But no, it's, uh, it's real cute and I can't wait to have him watching over me, over my uh, mm. schoolwork, judging me. And do you, uh, I'm not sure, like, again, I, I, well, I've only got, like, the one Funko Pop, but that Mr. Knight one, that's a standard sized Funko, right? Because there are different sizes, right? They're, like, smaller ones and, and kind of medium sized ones. Is that a, that's a standard size one, right? Yeah, I think so. The price, the, mm. the price range, it seems to be indicating, oh, yeah, true. suggests it's probably that price. Yeah, because I've seen some pictures, and it looks like the figure's not really small. I don't know, maybe it's just the way they take the um, take the photo um, of it. But yeah, I just thought maybe, oh, maybe it is a, a smaller version. Um, I don't know, but you're right. Yeah, look, if it's a, a standard price, then it should be 
I guess, a standard size. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, not much on the news there, Connor. Anything, anything else? Um, yeah. I mean, I was real. <laughs> I made some over overblown uh, comments at the start, talk, talking up this uh, podcast a bit, uh, vamping us for time. But yeah, it's really quite a <laughs> quite a small week because really, um. It'll be the end of next week. We cover the the last issue of the Lemire run, and then the week after that, we have the first issue of the Bemis run. I think it's real, sort of the quiet before the storm. Before we actually have it in our hands, we have it. We have interviews and more in depth looks looks at it. That sort of yeah. So we apologise for light news this week, and probably even a a lighter episode in general. But we are uh, we hope it. Oh, hope it's still entertaining that these uh, comic reviews coming up will keep you. Swab, yeah, sweet. exactly. Uh, a um, yeah, perfect way of putting it. I think it's it is probably the calm before the storm, um, because look, we've had big weeks of news, haven't we, as well? So, um, you know, it comes in peaks and troughs, and uh, you know, I just I can't wait when that first issue hits in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of buzz generated around it. So, um, yeah, yeah. Let's just let's take this opportunity as a, you know. A bit of a chilled, relaxed episode, <laughs> um, and and uh, yeah, we can go on to our reviews. But um, I'm just having a quick look at at Twitter at the moment, um, just to see if I can come up with <laughs> with anything else. That uh, uh, nothing seems to. There's a there's a few pictures on uh, the Funko Pops, so obviously they're they're um, they're quite uh, people are conscious. It's in the public eye. Um, but no, yeah, no, nothing. I think that's, uh, that's it for the news, Connor. So, um, how about we go to Over the Moon? <gasps> yeah, and, uh, as always, we've got a... Oh, Ray, would you actually like to start us off with a bit of a, bit of a recap page before we head on to the bare bones with our surprise, surprise guest? Oh, yes. Excellent. Of course. Sure. Um, so where we left off with Lemire's issue, um, we, um, oh, pff, it is as follows. <laughs> after, <laughs> I don't know how to start it. <laughs> um, after a confrontation with his alternate identities where they seemed to disappear for good, Mark realized that the final step to becoming whole again was to kill Conchu. Even with this measure of closure, Mark's past, from hospitalisation for mental illness to a dishonourable discharge from the Marines to his entry into the dangerous world of a mercenary follows him. Before finding Conchu, Mark went to reclaim Crawley from the god Anubis, but Anubis required a trade, sending Mark on a journey to free his wife Unput from the Overvoid. And when Mark faced a brutal death, his rescue came from none other than the other identities he thought he had banished. Less present, but never truly gone. Now, Mark's last and most difficult fight lies ahead. So, uh, yeah, that was a, a great last issue. Um, which, uh, yeah, we had a, we had the guest narrator Eve, um, uh, give us a, a stirring rendition of, uh, of part okay. three. But, uh, yeah, but Connor, we have, uh, we now have part four. Yes, and, uh, without further ado, I believe I'll let him introduce himself. As we head into our bare bones for uh, Moon Knight, issue 13 of the Jeff Lemire, Greg Smallwood, and Geordie Butler run. Hey there, Ray Connor and all the fellow loony listeners. This is Derek. I'm the co-host and producer of Gotham TV Podcast about the TV show Gotham and Defenders TV Podcast all about the Netflix Marvel Defenders TV shows. I'm delighted to bring you this week's guest narration for the 13th episode of Into the Night, the Moon Knight Podcast. So sit back, relax, and grab a glass of something cold because it's on to this week's narration. Moon Knight, Volume 8, Issue 13, Death and Birth, Part 4 of 5. This was released in January this year. It was written by Jeff Lemire, inked and penciled by Greg Smallwood, coloured by Jordi Belair, lettering was by Corey Pettit, edited by Jake Thomas, and the cover was also by Greg Smallwood. As Mark Spector and Bertrand Crawley alight from the cosmic raft of Anubis, preparing to re-enter the hospital and kill Khonshu, Anubis warns Mark of the path he's travelling. 
Having spent much of his life running from his illness, Mark sees this is the only path for him now and bids Anubis a fond farewell. Having saved Crawley's soul, Mark also asks for Crawley to find Gina's diner to stay there, out of harm's way. Crawley is reluctant, but Mark is firm in his belief to face Conchu alone, and so Crawley honours Mark's wishes, admiring his resolve. The journey through the other void's tomb-like passageways begins to speak to Mr. Knight. It is the voice of Conchu, and he's glad to see Mr. Knight's return. Things never appear as they seem in the other void, and what was once a passageway turns into the horizon of brain matter, a representation of Mr. Knight's mind presented before him by Conchu. Taken aback, Mr. Knight's moment of weakness echoes the brain he stands upon, and like quicksand, it slowly sucks him under. A flashback to the past shows Mark and Frenchie alongside Bushman, en route to the next job, an archaeological site near the Sudanese-Egyptian border. Mark questions Bushman on the amount of weaponry they've brought along, considering that there'll be no soldiers, only civilians present. Bushman replies that the reason is to create fear, the one true weapon for victory. As they arrive, Frenchie is uneasy, but Mark is still optimistic that no harm will come of the innocent, and that Bushman's tactics are all for show. Bushman terrorizes Marlene and her father, Peter Allerain, the head of the archaeological team, and when Marlene refuses to relinquish the information on the tomb that they have recently unearthed, Bushman brutally murders Peter in front of her. Shocked, Mark decides to take action. Returning to the other void, Mr. Knight slowly fights his way out of the giant brain, but it manages to smother him again, and this time Mark finds himself floating in the night sky with Conchu's eye, the full moon, peering at him. Conchu tempts Mr. Knight to embrace the moon and essentially succumb to Conchu, but Mr. Knight refuses and, remembering why he returned in the first place, destroys the moon by throwing his crescent darts at it. Conchu is shocked and pleads for Mr. Knight to do no more damage, as it's also his own mind that Mr. Knight is damaging. Ignoring Conchu's warnings, in one final blow, Mr. Knight frees himself and finds himself burst out of the brain and into the subway, which leads back to the hospital. Returning to Mark's past, Mark and Bushman exchange blows, and it's Bushman who finally has the better of the two. Bloodied and unconscious, Mark is left for dead, whilst Bushman takes Marlene and another of her team to lead him through their sight. In a final sweep before departing in the chopper, Bushman orders the rest of the archaeological team killed, and Bushman's team line them up and shoot them down. Frenchie is forced to pilot the chopper for Bushman as they leave to head towards the entrance of the tomb, leaving Mark behind. As memories of the past are played out, we see Mr. Knight finally make his way through the subway and into the hospital, where his final confrontation with Kanshu awaits. Good stuff. <laughs> Great stuff. <laughs> that was yeah, cool. So Thanks. Sort of, uh, thank yeah. You. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, sort of, a shout out to the boys over at Defenders uh, TV podcast. They really are a fantastic podcast, and uh, we're honoured to have them on our show. Really, I think quite honestly. Exactly, and oh, f- oh for sure, it, it is. It's uh, you, you know, when I actually first started listening to a lot of podcasts, they were one of the, well, one of the first podcasts I listened to. So, uh, and they kind of got me. Um, kind of drawn into this whole podcast world. So, uh, thanks so much, guys, for, for having, um, for, for coming on, on our show. Um, and let's not forget as well, as Derek mentions, um, they are also on Gotham, uh, TV podcast yeah, totally. as well. Mm, so between those two podcasts, which those guys do, um, oh, there's something like 250 episodes. So they are, um, well versed in in podcast and highly entertaining so yeah thanks derek yeah so uh when it comes to this wonderful issue ray what were your first impressions before we crack on with our aspects yeah i um i actually i remember this kind of when when this issue yeah. first came out okay, it honestly yeah. gave me and good nostalgia a... vibes <laughs> yeah definitely we we um and we would if i can say we were both gobsmacked by it. it was mm. truly one of those really, really special issues, um, uh, and, and you know the whole journey um, in this arc has been really good. But uh, I found just the surrealism, I guess, with with Mister Knight uh, uh, battling Conchu in his mind, um, and a retelling, um, and I mean that in a good way of of uh, Mark and Bushman's origins. Uh, I just thought this episode was was stellar. Yeah, what, what what did you think? Yeah, I think yeah, we um this was the first review that came out when this um the uh the Into the Night group page started back when it was called Fista Conchu and we sort of had a 
no idea we'd be oh, uh, starting yes. a, a podcast in the coming months. So we were actually talking on there with sort of the the first loonies deep in conversation. So yeah, it's that's it's right. probably fresh that's in right. my mind. January of this year. Um, it's yeah, it's kind of crazy how long we're getting our, our new one in two weeks when this one was only finished. You know. January, February, but I think it's just a stellar issue, you know. Honestly, mm. rereading this run over what ten months later, it was just as gobsmacking as it was the first time. You know, these these last mm. two issues probably stick in my head the most, and returning um, to them now, there was still stuff I was like, "Whoa!" Like just completely had me. Like as, as this whole run is done, yeah. but you know, this is. These last two issues, you'll probably hear us say the the perfect climax to this crazy, hectic run. Yeah, just when you think it can't get any better, um, Lemire just uh, he's really he's really come into his own, uh, hasn't he? Over the last couple of years, um, uh, yeah, these last two issues, he just wraps up uh, beautifully. So um, it's good, and and it's funny that you mentioned uh, that it came out only in January because yeah, that is not that long ago. But I guess since there's such a sheer volume, and depending on what type of comic book reader you are, there's such a sheer volume of, of comics that you actually go through, um, you know, uh, you know, different publishers and, and different titles and such. It just seems, um, like yonks ago that it was, that this was released. But as you say, it, it's not even a year ago that it, that it got released. So that's really crazy stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was a mind-blowing issue. Um, where shall we start? Uh, how about your first aspect, Connor? If my first aspect, and probably, uh, you know, when people talk about this run, we've always got to wonder whether this was truly always 100% in uh, Mark's head or there's some truth to the uh, overvoid and other void. But uh, the first issue is kind of the uh, bombshell truth about, you know, con- Conchu, it seems, to... Uh, have the the truth here is that uh, Conchu seems to have a locked Mark in his mind in a desperate battle to to absorb Mark into his own mind, leaving Mark a mindless puppet for for Conchu's mm. control. You know, this is this is our final battle deep within a deep within Mark's mind, where Conchu seems to have full control. Mm. And it's um it's actually uh, it's in it's in contrast to um the first arc. Um, you know, the first, uh, five or six issues of Lemire's run, in where, at the end of that arc, remember, Conchu was revealing that he wanted to actually physically, um, you know, take over Mark's body, because he needed that, he needed a vessel to enter, you know, the, our world. Um, so, Conchu first was, was trying to, um, commandeer, I guess, Mark, um, with his physic, you know, by, by overtaking him physically. Uh, and here now we see in the third arc towards the end of the whole title run. Um, yeah, we revealed that Conchu is a being a bit, being a bit more subtle and he's trying to control Mark, you know, through his mind. Um, which is, you know, nothing, nothing new or groundbreaking. Um, but I just thought it was a nice contrast between the two. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, um, I think what this run really does is make Conchu a really, threatening villain like i mean he was fantastically brutal in the houston run is just about everything in that run was but you know mm. here it's sort of in in this issue that's really about mark's own headspace and the fact that conchu very much sort of locks mark inside his own head and trying to make him touch this object inside his mind to take full control that conchu's really yeah, you're right. It's a lot more subtle. It's not, you know, in your face, kill yourself. It's it's belittling him, manipulating, trying to make him the smallest he can be. So he's so desperate to to become, you know, a mindless puppet for Conchu. Yeah, and I think it's just great how um, it's represented with Mark um, literally walking on a, a brainscape, um, literally just a brain. It was. It's just got that level of totally. You know, weird <laughs> um, uh, from the mind of Lemire. I think it's just it's just perfect. It's really well done. And then as Mark gets sucked into his own brain, it's just um, it's it's a pretty good way to to visually show it. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, we'll come back to this point in sort of uh, 
my second aspect, but chop between this fight for uh, Mark's brain, Conchu suffers him uh, through his own past with Bushman, which leads us on to uh, your first aspect. Yeah, I thought one of the um, and and I guess look, it's uh, on the front cover as well. You've <laughs> got just the full face of Bushman, uh, which is a great you know he was a great reveal um, in the previous issue, uh, and is always. Um, you know, associated with, with Moon Knight. So it was good to see him pop up uh, in Lemire's run um, because he was quite heavily used in uh, in Houston's run, albeit um, like Conchu uh, taking the form of, of the dead Bushman. But um, for a good 11, um, 11 and a half issues... We didn't see Bushman at all, and uh, he he's kind of like the arch enemy, right, of Moon Knight. So you kind of expect to see him somewhere. Um, so this issue very much, I think, um, uh, kind of retells Bushman's origin as well as as well as Marx. And um, this is, I found, a very important issue because it actually shows the the turning point uh, where. Uh, Mark, Frenchie and Bushman are like colleagues, um, but they essentially part ways because of this brutal thing that Bushman does, which is, which is kill Marlene's dad, um, just quite, you know, callously. Um, and from that point on, uh, I think that's where we both get Mark deciding, okay, I'm not going to be working for or working with Bushman anymore. And we also get Bushman, um, defeating Mark and essentially leaving him for dead, which is the catalyst for him to actually become Moon Knight. So it's a, um, I think it's an important chapter for, for both Mark and, uh, and Bushman. And I think, again, Lemire and Smallwood have done really well here. Um, I wonder as well, Connor, with, with Bushman's face paint, I wonder if um, Smallwood um, got some... I got influenced a little, at least, by um, Heath Ledger's Joker in um, yeah, act- Chris Nolan's yeah, Batman. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, yeah. Mm, because uh, it's the first time I've seen the the war paint of, of Bushman in such a... Um, I don't know how to describe it. In such a uh, uh, <laughs> Joker-esque, um, <laughs> Heath Ledger Joker-esque, like, uh, yeah. it's kind of It kind of dribbles down... Um, and the white face paint is kind of haphazardly kind of put on there. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a really good effect. It makes him, makes him really look scary. Although, if you do look at some shots of Bushman, he is actually still very, very human behind there. Um, I'm actually looking at, there's, uh, Looney's, if you got your, your issues out with you, it's on page 10. Um, it's towards the bottom. There are two facial shots of Bushman and of Marlene. And Marlene's, um, Again, Smallwood's art. Can't you can't say enough about it? It's just fantastic, <laughs> the expression. But yeah, B- Bushman's face there. It's um, he's actually he's not sneering. He's not angry. He's not showing much emotion, and he's actually got a calm look on his face, uh, and it makes him look actually you know quite human behind that makeup, which I think is really really cool. Yeah, in that original sort of, you know, even the Houston Houston telling and um. Bushman getting his poor old face cut off, um, you know that very much almost seems like a a tattoo. But here, it, it mm. yeah, it really does seem it's very much face paint. And I think um, yeah, just to go back to the general point of Bushman here, you know that that first issue of you know the first uh, issue of um, uh, Munch's uh, run back in the eighties, you know what really kicked off mm-hmm. the Moon Knight series. That that first issue does a lot. It tells the origin. He has a battle in the yes. present. This sort of retelling really takes us back and gives us a a lot more emotional and full frontal look at those periods that just wouldn't you know wouldn't have been achievable with almost the writing of the eighties. B- Bushman's really brutal here. We see the deep knife, you know, knife jutting out of um. Marlene's father and the brutality of Bushman and the expressive faces of Smallwood and the, the you know the absolute decimation of the of the town by these uh by these two mercenaries Bushman carries behind them as as uh, lap dogs. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. really you know taking us back. It's 
it's really full on and sort of makes the origin and sort of Mark's own like resistance against this possibly, I don't know, a bit more memorable sort of, ju- well, not just sort of yeah. different really, I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it is a little bit of a risk, kind of like retelling the origin mm. again, because it's like, well, why, why do we need to, why do we need to, like, look at it again? And it has been done a few times, but, um, I guess one of the points here that I think is interesting is, um, as you say, the brutal slaying of, uh, Peter Alrain, I think, the, the dad. Um, in the original Monch run, I think Bushman, um, I can't remember. I think he bites, he bites him in the neck to kill him or, or he, he snaps his neck. And it's funny. Each time you see the origin, uh, retold, um, I do believe that Marlene's dad dies in different ways all the time, <laughs> all the time. So this time he gets stabbed like right through. I'm pretty sure. Um, Looney's, if you, if you know, um, please, please post up, um, on our group. But I'm pretty sure I've seen his neck snapped. And I'm pretty sure I've seen him being bitten, uh, on the neck, um, by Bushman's, you know, sharp gold teeth. So it's really funny how that keeps, keeps on changing when they, you know, go through the origins again. Um, the only, the other thing as well, like you're talking about the, um, the lackeys, the, the lap dogs of Bushman. Um, I definitely think that these guys are um, uh, referred to. Well, I think these guys are basically Billy and Bobby, the the wardens of the hospital. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. I could be totally wrong, only because like you know, one's an African American, the other guys you know got orange hair, um, but they don't look exactly the same. You know what I mean? Like, there's no big afro with a comb in it, and there's no mullet on um, on Billy. But you know. I think I think there's going to be a connection there as well. Yeah, definitely. You know, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think you make a really good point there, and I think that's true because Billy and Bobby in the asylum are really sort of uh, caricatures. You know, they're mm. really you know um, I can't remember which one's which, but um, yeah, I can't remember. You as know, well. um, Billy is like or one of them's like a black boy character of when Moon Knight was first released in the 80s when, you know, we had the real sort of white writers on these black characters bringing them to the forefront and then um, Bobby, with the, the other one with the mullet and all that's really sort of, you know, making fun of almost a classic sort of redneck bogan stereotype that you really, you really see. <laughs> yeah. You really see on the Yeah, that, I mean, that's what... Yeah, I, I, I get that. I mean, like, that's how I see him as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But and yeah, that, but they're also like sorry, they're also like reoccurring. So they're reoccurring characters as the wardens, Billy and Bobby. So I always wondered like they've there's got to be some level of importance to them. Like they seem to be like Lemire seems to have like crafted them to be kind of semi um, semi recurring slash semi important characters. And um, yeah, and for the life of me, I think that they were totally. I mean, I couldn't figure out whether they were historical characters or not. I don't, I'd never come across them before, so I'm pretty sure Lemire created them. But, um, yeah, they seem to have some sort of relevance to Mark's past. Um, so that would kind of make sense with them being the mercenaries here. So in, in Mark's origins, he actually was on a team with these guys, you know, and so that's how I, I think that they'll be connected. Yeah, no, I definitely agree, and that's sort of like, these are the real sort of very vicious people and inside his own head or mm. wherever this asylum in, you know, they've sort of been turned into caricatures as these reoccurring villains. So I think you really yeah. cracked onto something. <laughs> yeah. But um, how about your uh, next aspect there, Connor? Uh, it's time to get real, just lovingly, <laughs> lovingly ranty. Um, so the real sort of crux of this issue is we really have three points. We have inside... Mark's mind at the start. We have the past, and then we have the actual asylum. And I sort of saw it as like, you know, the brain is Conchu's domain where he's controlling Mark, and then it's very much Mark's focus from the past, and then the asylum sort of where they meet. And almost in the way we saw in the second arc, how the, the different art styles blend Smallwood, Belair, and um, Corey Petit really 
really make it blend as well, cutting between these three aspects just so it's so dynamic and how well it plays with the narration. That sort of the really cold, like almost dank, you know, dark blues of um inside the brain and then the uh the very you know, the dark the dark skies and the you know, not really golden crisp sand, but sort of very very washed over sand of Mark's past and then this asylum which has a lot of shots of both gold and blue before the uh sort of really grimy reveal at the end of the asylum. It really just works so well with how we see you know, it's switching between realities and how Conchu uses this to belittle Mark. And I think mm. and it's a really big shout out I gotta give here to um Corey Petit's lettering because I think the biggest thing of this issue with his incredible lettering is the lettering of Conchu himself. Conchu is really oh, yes. specific text that guides that acts almost as a guide across the page, but is sort of so powerfully used as this um as a real omnipresent sort of being because it it both sticks out with how Conchu controls controls Mark in this book, but it also very much controls the reader. You know, we're seeing something outside mm. of a text bubble. This is almost Conchu's yes. domain, and we as a reader even feel like he has total control of what we're reading. Mm. It's it's really cool because it's uh, in char- it's in contrast to uh, the next book that we're going to review in this episode with Black Panther, where we actually um, we actually see Conchu. Um, but, uh, yeah, but in this issue, it's really good because, um, you, as you say, with the lettering, it's, it's kind of, it leads you around and there's no, it's not within any word balloon or anything like that. So it kind of just floats around and you never actually see Conchu. You only see, um, the full moon, which I guess represents him. Mm. So he, he ta- he really takes on this kind of godlike, um, you know, being, uh, and, and something that's way more powerful, you know, um, than the Mr. Knight and Mark Spector. And it, yeah, and I think that the lettering, uh, and, and that fact that you don't really see Conchu at all, um, really adds to the power of, um, of Conchu as a character. Uh, I think that was, yeah, really good. Um, also, I mean, uh, I've got as a little note there, but, um, you're, you're mentioning the, the creative team, um, and the Geordie Belair's colours. I did love the, um, when they're in the chopper, it kind of brought me back to, to Predator, actually, where they're sitting in the chopper and they got the red light. Um, oh. so Geordie Belair, yeah, she, she does, oh, it's just beautiful because it's, um, as you're saying, the sandy desert colours of, of in the past, but when they're in the chopper, it's just really deep red, which, um, you know, I don't know. For me, it, it always harks back to the um, the opening scene in um, in Predator when the the team are in there. Um, you know whether or not that <laughs> that was a, a, a an influence on this. I don't know, but like um, I, I just really dug the the colours here by Belair. Um, well, so I just actually pulled up the first issue of the uh, the Munch um, uh, Sinkevich run, and it mm-hmm. sorry, uh, it is kind of a um. Very sort of different retelling, you know, these Bushman, Mark and um, Frenchie really sort of drop in to um, drop into the desert Lemire's run, just sort of cause havoc, you know, that this, uh, the original story seems to have them fly down, then get, um, is it Peter Alrain, the father? Yeah. Yeah, to show them around before they kill him, just before the temple, like finding the temple in the town. It's sort of very, it's almost like a cut down rendition of it in Lemire's run, which is for the page space as well and sort of what he wanted to do with Bushman. But that's just an interesting, if anyone sort of yeah. wants to compare the origins. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I've pulled it up as well. And uh, yeah, you can see, I think um, yeah, Bushman does bite the neck. Of, yes, uh, he does. Oh yeah, and that's how he kills him. And I'm pretty sure I saw some. I, I don't know where. It might have been Mark Spector, Moon Knight, but I think I saw him uh, snap a neck as well. So, <laughs> isn't <laughs> there a, bit um, of a retelling there? Yeah, isn't there sort of also a retelling in the Houston run? Oh yeah, uh, there is actually. You, you're mm. right. It was a very, um, a very cool one actually. Uh, it was the the profile uh, was making a presentation, I think, to the committee. And uh, they were pro- he was basically 
kind of like profiling Mark Spector and yeah, they, they kind of went through his origin um, via, you know, like a slideshow at a presentation. Um, and I thought that was done really well. And, um, and in that, in that, um, telling of the origins, you have, uh, I think Houston was saying that Bushman, Frenchie and Mark were all, uh, you know, mercenaries, like brothers in arms. Um, whereas you see in Lemire's one here, uh, Bushman is, is the employer of, um, because remember last issue, Rahim takes Frenchie and Mark to see, you know, to see the boss, because he's got a, you know, a job that he wants them to handle personally. So in Lemire's run, Bushman's more of a, um, more of the, the boss, basically, um, rather than a, a partner in, you know, partner in crime mm. for, for Mark and Frenchie. So, uh, and in Mun- Munch's run, um, I guess they're, they're colleagues as well, right? Uh, I don't think, I'm just quickly looking at, at it now. Uh, yet, um, oh no, it says here in the first caption, it was at dawn that the mercenary commando squad under the command of the skull face terrorist for hire Bushman. So in, in Munch's, uh, Munch's run, yeah, Bushman is the, um, is the commander. Like he's a leader of the of the squad, so yeah, yeah slight differences in all of them. But uh, yeah, yeah um, th- th- I mean, sorry. No, you go on. By all means. Oh no, I was just about to say, um, yeah. Well, um, anything else about uh, about the the Mister Knight part of the of the plot for you, Connor? That you enjoyed? Um, I think. Uh, I think we're finally going to get on to the last bit of uh, the Mr. Knight uh, um, plot point as we go into your final aspect, actually. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's let us let in through that. Cause, um, and, yeah, basically, my last aspect was towards the end and, and how Mr. Knight returns to the hospital. So we essentially get a a full circle from all the way from issue one, um, the first arc, um, through to um, Welcome to New Egypt, through the second arc, Incarnations, and now in the last arc, Death and Birth, um, Mr. Knight returns to the hospital, which he fought so hard to escape, but he needs to go back there to uh, to face Konshu for the final showdown. Um, in order to get to the hospital, um, what we see, I thought was really great in this issue as well, is um, him actually breaking free of Konshu's hold, uh, and what Mark does again, I think similar to um, to how he deals with Conchu in the first arc, Mark essentially destroys himself, right? So he he uh, starts bashing away and um, destroying the brain, basically. And and Conchu's going, what you know, what are you doing? And he's going, well, he uh, his mind's damaged enough already, so he, he yeah, might as well yeah, that was a great little. Yeah, so he basically busts out of the brain, um, and the brain leads to the subway, which then leads to uh, the hospital. So if you remember from um, the very first arc, to escape the hospital, they had to go down through the tunnels and, and out and up. So uh, yeah, we see Mark come back, but uh, I thought it was really great how Mark, um, or Mr. Knight, decides to destroy his brain matter in order to defeat Conchu. Well, it, defeat not totally defeat him, but I mean defeat him to to get out of that that grasp that Conchu seemed to have on his mind, and that kind of always linked me to um, Welcome to New Egypt, Connor. When remember how Conchu wanted to use Mark's body, and then Mark goes, "No, nope, you can't have it," and then he jumps to his death. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of self sacrifice or, or a lot of um, well, a lot of self harm actually <laughs> from Mark Spector in order to get away from Conchu. Um, and I, yeah, I thought that was uh, again done really well here. Yeah, I also love as well, you know, the point of um, you know, conscious screaming, "Do not do this!" as he beats his own brain off. You damage your mind any mm. further. And Mark's yeah. just like a little late for all that, and it's just just wonderful him beating out, and also the colours of like the paneling of also Mark's arm just disappearing in this blue mass, only to pop out yeah. in a dirty asylum subway. With the mummies from the yeah. first arc as well. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. They're all uh, they're all dead, and um, you know they're not going to be scaring him anytime soon. But yeah, the, and also the uh, the sound effects they got him punching <laughs> the the brain and it, it and gross. it's sploot. <laughs> yeah, it's quite it's quite gross, but it's uh, really well um, real captured by those uh, uh, onomatopoeic um, words. So it's pretty pretty cool, uh, and he even takes out his old. Um, his old crescent darts as well. You yeah, to really sort of relinquish he... control, inflicting onto his own pain in the destroying an aspect yeah. of himself in that full moon. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, no, I was. Uh, that's what I thought. It was uh, really, really well told. And uh, as you mentioned before, um, just the way that the the creative team has kind of um, jumped between these two plot points is really cool. Uh, and at the end, uh, you almost see. Um, well, there's oh, not really. I was about to say, towards the end, uh, page twenty, you see uh, a combination of of the two plots together. So you see Mister Knight coming um, or entering the the hospital, or going up, uh, and, and that's interspersed with with Mark left for dead. So, um, yeah, there's there's a uh, a few parallels there happening. So um, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, and I suppose sort of the wonderful final page of this issue in the uh, back, hundred percent in the grimy, very empty asylum. You know, it's it looks fully decayed here. Yeah, and you've got to tip your hats off to again, I guess, the creative team and the art because it really does look like a dingy. Um, you get that sense of it's almost mm-hmm. like musty and 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 you know dusty and stuff, um, and. I don't know, that's pretty hard to do, um, like visually. And I'm zooming in, and there's a lot of speckles in there. Have you, you see that, Connor? Yeah. Um, so, speckles, um, and that's used with the light as well, which I guess is the colouring from Geordie Belair. So, really brilliant stuff here. Uh, and we get that weird panel layout at the end again, with um, with that upside down upside down triangle at the bottom. Um, but yeah, all all set for a a fantastic show showdown to come. <laughs> um, what did you get? What did you think about it for like Krasendart ratings, Connor? Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm I'm almost feeling bad being so positive about <laughs> it. You know, it's sort of been a high point, but I think it's just such a good issue. <laughs> it would it really is, be it is. so high. You know, sort of perfect. Five out of five, a seven out of five. You know, what are we looking at yeah. here? <laughs> oh, so you give it a seven out of five? I guess I would. Yeah, I mean, I'm just sort of yeah. Sorry, I just sort of took that break to flip back. You know, it's definitely almost this book's own calm before the storm, before it hits that climactic final. But when it comes to that, it's just so well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um. I, I share your sentiments as well. I think it's um, it is difficult, um, because I know that we are been very positive about this run, but it it is really up to me. It was one of the um, one of one of the the top runs uh, that Marvel released. Um, you know, up there with I reckon the Vision as well, yes. um, around the same mm. time. Um, so you had these two just firing on all cylinders, and uh, and. Like Lemire was writing other, and and he write he was writing other Marvel titles uh, as well. Um, the other one of note is Old Man Logan, which is pretty good. But I was reading his Extraordinary X Men, and it was to me that was a bit flat. Yeah, no, you know? for so, sure. So, um, mm, and it just seemed to me that he excelled, uh, or he maybe he put more care into the Moon Knight one, uh, Moon Knight Run. And you can really see it, I think. Uh, I think he's he's really had a uh, a goal of what he wanted to 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 tell in Moon Knight, and he's he's mapped it out so well. Um, so I mean, I can't give it praise enough. I, I'd I'd say this would probably be one of my favourite issues um, of the uh, of the whole run. I think. So I, I'd give it a yeah look. I'll give it a five out of five. <laughs> don't get too too crazy, but like that that's like you know perfect, right? So um, it was just it was phenomenal. So 
I want to kind of bring it back to 100%. So it's, yeah, yeah five out of five. Yeah, don't bucks. take my over over the fives as anything. It's just kind no, of no, no, no. I mean, my that's weird just thing. as good as uh, well. <laughs> but yeah, no. But, I, um, um, oh god, <laughs> I'll let you speak. What's happened? Oh, no, that's all right. I just wanted to say also, um, this is a final um, a footer to this issue as well. If you look in the Mooney missives, the uh, the letters page, there's also some pretty cool cosplaying. Yeah, it's happening. wonderful. Yeah. So right. you have um, what I imagine is what what is the the fist of Conchu uh, Moon Knight costume. Um, so he's got the ankh on his chest, and he's got the gold gold uh, bands and the the gold belt. And then there's a uh, one of Mister Knight, which uh, which looks pretty cool as well. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, great cosplay on the Twitter sphere as well. If you follow Lemire. He's usually posting about some cool pos- uh, cosplays, and Moon Knight always sort of popping up every convention. Actually, so yeah, oh, okay, yeah, cool, cool, cool. So yeah, that um, we've only got one more issue to go for for um for the Lemire's run. It's, yeah, the um, big finale really next week. Hmm. Yeah, but uh, look, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We do have another um comic to review this episode um, and I guess we'll throw it back to our guest narrator Derek to give us the details on to the second narration for this the 13th episode of Into the Night we're on to Black Panther Volume 3 Issue 22 Nightmare this was released in September 2000 and written by Christopher Priest the penciler was Sal Veluto and inker Bob Almond it was coloured by Steve Olaf lettering was by Paul Tutorone it was edited by Joe Casada. And the cover was also by Sal Valuto. We find out that Moon Knight and Black Panther have been gone in the spiritual plane to receive healing from Khonshu to restore his bonds to the Panther God for a week. Deep within the Kingdom of the Dead, Black Panther battles Nightmare, ruler of the Dream Dimension who has followed the two heroes into the spiritual plane. Nightmare easily overpowers Black Panther as he feasts upon the souls and dreams of Black Panther and his ancestors. Nightmare has him trapped, forcing him to relive memory after memory of his childhood and failing to kill the man who would kill his father. That is until Moon Knight, healed from his wounds of last issue, appears to slap him out of the villain's hold. Nightmare then vanishes without a trace. Moon Knight and Black Panther discuss their next course of action revealing that Nightmare feeds off the dreams of sleeping mortals and is now feasting off Moon Knight and Panther inside their comas. Realising that Nightmare cannot feast off dead souls and that Nightmare is not all-powerful outside of his dream realm in the kingdom, they venture forth to find the key to his demise while he is weakened in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, Moon Knight and Black Panther try to find Khonshu, only to be faced with Khonshu's guardians. Using the Book of the Dead, they retrieve last issue. However, they use the book's abilities to protect them from evil as a convincing argument that they mean no harm to Khonshu. Moon Knight is unconvinced this is the really Khonshu, but Panther accepts his presence and hears what he has to say. Khonshu warns that if they don't hurry and complete the pilgrimage for the renewal of communion with the Panther God, they will be trapped as living souls in the kingdom of the dead forever. With renewed faith and guidance from Khonshu, Black Panther finds he can use the Book of the Dead to travel to Nightmare's realm and sever his connection to his own plane of existence. Moon Knight takes control of his own memories to call forth the Moon Copter for the travel ahead. In the final push to the end, Mark reclines in the copter as Black Panther pilots with the Book of the Dead to make it to the outskirts of the Dream Realm. The two realize that Khonshu and his followers have followed them for the assault on Nightmare, only for Black Panther to come to the realization. Nightmare's weakened state means he has limited hold on those he submits to his will, and that he willingly let Black Panther take the Book of the Dead, as it would lead Nightmare home. Nightmare is lost in the land of the dead and growing weaker every hour, and needs to return home to be trapped in the spiritual plane forever. As T'Challa begins to destroy the book to stop Nightmare, Khonshu and his followers then reveal themselves as Nightmare's minions, and Moon Knight revealed as Nightmare himself. Black Panther has the upper hand, however, if T'Challa destroys the Book of the Dead, then Nightmare can never go home and will be stuck to the spiritual realm forever, until he perishes. He bargains with Nightmare, allowing Nightmare to use the book to return home only if he releases Black Panther, the souls of his ancestors, and allows them to complete their quest. Nightmare accepts his defeat as he lets out a cry, and T'Challa then awakens finally back in the real world. Moon Knight is returned, 
and T'Challa's bonds are restored. Thanks so much, Connor and Ray and Lily listeners for having me for this episode. Really interesting and really fun comic books to discuss this time coming up to Halloween and your 13th episode. Hopefully I'll talk to you again over on Gotham TV podcast or Defenders TV podcast. See you soon. The classic, the classic Derek back at it again for a very classic run. You know, when, yeah, when you think fantastic. some of Marvel's greats, I think Black Panther, Christopher Priest, Black Panther is very much up there. Oh, it it definitely is. I, I think it's actually uh, Priest Run more so, and uh, this is just my opinion, more so than um, Ta-Nehisi Coates for me uh, is is the seminal Black Panther, um, and it's it really it actually drew me into the character. Um, I always kind of did like him, but he he always seemed like the fringe character to me. But um, I remember listening to another podcast, which was um, about Marvel uh, Marvel movies uh, and news. Anyway, they uh, they talked about Priest Run, um, and it's a long one. So I thought, well, might as well read it. It's all available on uh, Marvel Unlimited, and it is such a journey. Um, it's Priest has this massive scope and canvas to play with because he covers. Uh, I can't remember. Is it? Um, just like 50 or so issues. They're like, it's, a, it's a long run. Um, and he does so much to Black Panther. And what I love about Black Panther in Priest Run is that um, he pretty much has uh, a plan or a contingency for anything. Like he is you're super prepared. Like nothing will surprise Black Panther. And with that, it kind of makes him really, really hard to beat. And I just love that um, that part of uh, Black Panther. But have you have you read um, Priest's Run, Connor? Or oh yeah, definitely full full thing. Mm. And then his incredible uh, mini series that followed on from it called The Crew, fantastic as well. Ah yes, mm. yeah. yeah. Priest um, is a yeah. really good. Uh... Sorry. Oh, I'll let you go. I, I was just going so, on. To my no, sorry, sorry, Connor. <laughs> yep. Sorry, go on. I've honestly forgot now. <laughs> I'll, oh. let, I'll let you go. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. Um, yeah, so this was a, a really good issue, um, and uh, it was so much fun to have uh, Moon Knight on there. Um, and thanks once again, Derek, for, for telling us this nightmarish tale, which um, kind of is, uh, I guess it's the... It's the third part, right? I think it's the second or third part of um, of this arc um, by Priest. But this one, as you mentioned, kind of has the most uh, Moon Knight bits in it. So that, that's why we picked it. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a fantastic issue. There was so much happening. And uh, I just have to say, in our, um, in our uh, WordPress blog... Uh, I'll put the entire <laughs> synopsis that Connor uh, wrote for this. It was it's fantastic. It was fantastically written. It was a huge mammoth. What was it? Nine hundred words or so. Yeah, it was um, a bit crazy. But no, yeah. But that 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 kind of tells you how much uh, Priest has fit in into this issue. There was just so much going on, and so um, the bare bones, which Derek just. Um, just narrated, um, I've had to kind of edit out some of the bits, um, which were kind of like secondary plot points, um, only because, uh, yeah, otherwise <laughs> we'd have Derek uh, narrating a, a half-hour special. <laughs> um, so I think it, I think it's really good. But if we um, go to one of the aspects, which I guess yeah. is what I'm alluding, alluding to, is uh, Priest's uh, inimitable style and... And basically, he is. I think he's his very distinct writing style, um, and you pick it up straight away. It can be kind of, it can be overwhelming um, for for someone, I guess. I remember reading the first issue um, with uh, Everett Ross on the in his underpants on top <laughs> of a, a toilet, you know, scared of a rat. And I remember reading that issue, and I'm just going, oh, this is this is not really like 
the other comics, like the narrative. It's, it's very, I guess, dense. Um, but once you lock onto that style, it is so much fun. Um, and anyway, this issue is no different to, to that, you know. Um, we have Priest juggling two or three plot points. Um, the main one that we'll look at is obviously Black Panther and, and Moon Knight um, battling Nightmare. Uh, but you also have uh, what happens to to Everett Ross as well. Um, there's a whole whole story to that as well. Mm. Uh, and then you then you have kind of at the end, um, he's talking, he's trying to actually tie in, and he does it in a such a, a deliberate way um, <laughs> of like you know, oh, this is this is a um, you know blatant uh, you know plug for you know another comic, and uh, so you have the Avengers. Um, introduced there, and then you have Deadpool as well. There's just a lot happening. Um, but yeah, uh, Priest's uh, writing, I think, is one of the main highlights of this issue. Uh, what do you reckon, Connor? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, yeah, it, it's really dense. And I mean, reading this issue, it's twice, so nearly three times as long as other other issues. And that's the whole run, you know. Christopher Priest just packs his incredible writing and prose into every issue and you know for some people that 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 won't click and it won't for the entire run but you know I really just like you I think it's it's genius and as much as you you were talking about um Black Panther being such a smart and genius character you know Christopher Priest as a writer is equally incredible and a uh, genius and unbeatable I think uh, <laughs> to give yeah. a weird metaphor but uh yeah, no, I absolutely, I absolutely love this issue. You know, this uh, this issue as you um heard in the bare bones, and that I, I mean, it is a lot. Mu, I'd recommend reading it possibly before listening us waffle on because it's a it's a very full on issue. You know, <laughs> we do have a big political it undertone is. with idiot Everett Ross, and then we have this absolutely yes. crazy creative own sort of other other void overboid style spiritual realm. That just yeah. that's just absolutely insane from page to page. Oh, it's just crazy. And if you you look at even the first page, you've got Kazar as well. Um and so it opens up with something that totally jolt you um, you know, into this issue. Because you're you you're opening up a, a Black Panther book, you know, it's got a guest guest star Moon Knight, fair enough, you know, you open it first page, you've got Kazar um in court, of all things. Uh, and Everett Ross there, you know, being one of the the most amazing lawyers there are. And it's like, what is going on here, you, you know? Um, so it seems like, uh, I think there's a lot going on in Priest's mind. <laughs> and it's uh, it's just, yeah, non-stop. Um, and then you've got Brother Voodoo um, next as well. Uh, and, yeah, Connor, would you be able to maybe explain a bit uh, of this sub subplot with Everett Ross? Yeah, so sort of in the what you were talking about with uh um so in the in sort of the lead up and I suppose oh, I don't know when even at the start of this at this entire run cuz the thing about Priest is he um you know he, I think he's plotted this entire story out from issue run but yeah basically Black Panther's lost his bond with the Panther God which really sort of gives him his powers so the whole point of the arc is to go into the mine with Moon Knight, see Conchu, which will heal Black Panther, return his bond to the Panther God, and he can go back to being, you know, Black Panther, King of Wakanda. And in doing so, yeah. um, you know, you were talking about Black Panther also ha- always having contingency. Black Panther knew he would be gone for, you know, a while. It says they've been in the this spiritual realm for a week with, yeah. um, with, uh, with uh, Brother Voodoo, so Black Panther gives Everett Ross sort of emergency powers while he's gone, which is the undercurrent right. here. So, sort of what's happening in the subplot with Everett Ross in this issue is that he keeps having these dreams that Brother Voodoo's inflicting on him, and he thinks or, like, knows that um, they're a sign from Black Panther to sort of protect Wakanda while he's gone, and Everett Ross, a complete, uh, complete imbecile, uh, sort of <laughs> goes crazy with that and won't listen to anyone. You know, we see the security, like the um, minister of security, you know, trying to help him and Everett Ross won't have nothing for it. So 
he takes yeah. Black Panther's wishes and almost sort of not really perverts them, but just doesn't see them quite in the right light and tries to become the big hero of Wakanda. And I think he sees Craven the Hunter at the end of this issue, you know, just making dumb decisions while Black oh, Panther's yes. gone because he thinks he's doing right for Wakanda because that's what Black Panther gave him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot <laughs> happening here. It's, um, yeah, it's really hard. Um, where to start? But any, <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that was a pretty good summation there. Oh, as well, so, yeah, yeah. Um, how about one of your aspects, though? Um, well, I think uh, we'll talk about sort of the uh, the conch in this issue. We actually so yeah. this came out in two thousand. Um, so the the um after uh, Mark Spector Moon Knight um. Munch returned to the character with two uh, miniseries, which were High Strangers and Resurrection War. I think that's... Yes. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, just couldn't quite remember their names. And basically, I think those ended in 99. And up until Marvel Knights, and not even Marvel Knights, but not even until sort of Houston reinvigorated the character in 2006, no one did anything with Moon Knight. So in the 2000s, when I'm sure Marvel didn't have many plans from outside of the Marvel Knights book... I, I suppose Christopher Priest had all sort of reign to explore a different side of Moon Knight um, and the spiritual realm with uh, actually seeing Khonshu here in Egypt. You know, this is obviously a piece of lore Priest introduced that didn't last as we headed into the Houston run and definitely not the oh, yes. run and the Ellis run with the spooky bird skull head. But it's kind of an interesting look yeah. in the past that we have a very sort of visual look at Egyptian god Khonshu hanging out in uh, Egypt with his servants. Well, Pharaoh more than God. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is pretty cool, actually, to see Khonshu looking like this. Um, yeah, like knowing, um, you know, we're kind of really familiar with that bird skull now, aren't we? Because of, um, of Ellis's run, basically, 2000, what was that, 2014 or something? Um but yeah, no, it was a really nice, uh, nice thing to see. It's, it's very, very much um, Egyptian. Nothing, uh, yeah, nothing cosmic, as you're saying. No, no other void over voids. It's, it's definitely um, harking back to uh, Egyptian mythology. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm just looking through these pages now. Um, uh, I suppose I'll make the quick point that actually, you know, I was talking about the law didn't last, but uh, Conchu's character sort of lasts here that he's he's very belittling to Mark. You know, he he calls Mark mm. out for not doing the right thing, not doing the right thing, and you know, not realizing it's uh, um, not realizing it's Conchu because Mark doesn't believe him. Well, maybe right. We'll get to that in a little next aspect, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. No. That's, um, the next aspect I had was um, was Priest's portrayal of Moon Knight, uh, and initially, I don't know what your thoughts are, Connor, as well. But initially, when I was reading it, um, I didn't think that Priest had a good handle on m- the Moon Knight character. Just you know, from what we know from uh, the previous runs of Moon Knight and Doug Munch and. Uh, you know, just basically the character in general. Um, to me, I don't know, his personality just didn't seem, um, kind of true to the, to the character. It's difficult because it's hard to, hard to know how will, how will Moon Knight interact with, with Black Panther, you, you know? Um, I guess there, there wasn't much of his, uh, um, other identities, you know, that wasn't mentioned at all. He's pretty much a straight laced, um, like crime fighting character, uh, but yeah, to me, I don't know. He just he didn't he didn't seem to he didn't seem to 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 brood enough. <laughs> if I could just say that, <laughs> yeah, he um to me, I I mean, although <laughs> I was just lauding how great Priest is and and he is, he's good, but just to me, I think that he he didn't capture the essence of Moon Knight. Um, as I, as I kind of would have thought Moon Knight would have been. But that's that's kind of justified a little in the end in, anyway, isn't it, Connor? Because um, it's towards the, the end of the issue, it's revealed that Moon Knight is 
actually nightmare in disguise. And that so uh, you, you can, oh, yeah, and that nightmare even sort of like, had control over Conchu as well when we saw him. Mm. Yeah, so it can kind of that justify it like that, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, there was just something missing for me, like for for this portrayal of Moon Knight. But then again, as I said, maybe it's it's Priest's genius in writing him that way because he's not really Moon Knight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will agree, just because I sort of flick through... Well, I mean, I read this run like two years ago. It's pretty fresh in my m- mm. mind. And then I reread the two issues before this leading into my write-up for Bare Bones. Oh, but yes. yet, um, that character, you're definitely right. You know, I, I definitely don't think Moon Knight is quite who and what we love about him. You're right, he really doesn't sort of brood. He's kind of... He really he, he shoots off his mouth and is a bit smug as we've seen, but it's definitely sort of just the one personality, Mark Spector, as if running straight yeah. off the Mark Spector Moon Knight run, and that's yeah. and that's really sort of it. There there is definitely something missing, which is sort of what editorial was like for Moon Knight at the time. I think mm. if one day we go back and cover Marvel Knight the the team run, we might even find the same with Moon Knight there. But yeah, definitely it's yeah. You know, I I, I chose this as a Moon Knight issue, but it's really not a. Moon Knight's highest highest point here. Ah, oh, I mean it's still it's still a fun. A oh, fun it's a issue. great issue. Um, mm, and and I don't want to like you know tarnish it or anything like that. But um, yeah, it just seemed that like he was a bit more of a used Moon Knight was was used pretty much more like a, a standard, you know, to get the plot going, plot device going. Like uh, to me, it could have been, you know, who, who else in the Marvel universe has a uh, has a god, like has a god. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, like you, you could probably substitute. Uh, I guess what I'm saying you could probably substitute uh, Moon Knight and Conchu for someone else. And um, I think Sentry's still- the sort of the main one. He sort of has a god inside himself, doesn't he, or something crazy like that? Oh, does he? Oh, okay. Either that or sure. like some really powerful being inside Sentry. I just can't remember. From yeah, the oh, okay. To the Moon Knight. Yeah, Sentry is always a weird. He's a weird character, isn't he? he? Is I never really the got weirdest into him. Boy. <laughs> So, yeah, um, but yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that was uh, yeah. That's what I thought. The uh, just a portrayal of Moon Knight. Um, have you got another aspect there, Connor? Yes, uh, our final one. Um, we're, we're talking about the genius of um, Priest, and the the big battle here is not a brawl of fists, but minds. So this run, regardless if you've read the twenty one issues before it or jumping and fresh, it's a confusing issue. You know, we jump all around mm, the spiritual oh, realm. For sure. And we have this weird book guiding us, and Mark, that we don't know, is under the control of Nightmare. Um, you know, summons a moon copter from his memories. It's real confusing, but it's almost like a perfect detective show where they drop all the clues to see if the audience can solve it before the detective on the show does. And I think wonderful here, the final like five pages are Black Panther realizing that Nightmare has Mark and that he's given... Black Panther, the Book of Death, to guide him home, and he realizes that, and he begins ripping the book to bargain yeah. that if if he if um you know if Black Panther destroys the book, neither of them can get home, and Nightmare will perish. So that he needs to give up um he needs to return Mark and uh, T'Challa and the the Panther gods and T'Challa's ancestors, and it's just a brilliant yeah brilliant setup. Uh, it was, wasn't it? It's very. I think it was a very smart. Like I didn't, I didn't pick it at all. Um, uh, and it's one of those things that um, it's kind of Black Panther thinking out of the box. Uh, and it's so cool because, like, you as a reader, um, you're thinking, "Oh, geez, like he, you know, I didn't, I didn't see that coming." You know, I like it. It's it's very smartly written by by Priest um, because. I mean, for me, I don't know. Um, I don't know about the others, but um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't pick that as um, as an option. That the black what Black Panther did just by destroying the book. Um, but it's a very smart move by by Black Panther and, and very well written. So uh, it really, for me, this issue really ramps up towards that. Like once um, once Moon Knight reveals himself to be Nightmare, and then you have this uh, struggle. I mean, it's towards the end, admittedly. Um, 
uh, page 19 or so. Uh, but from there, um, I think it, re it really ramps up and it was really, really cool um, what had happened. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was very good. I was just having a, a little look here, Connor. Sorry, just further up. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, because I guess what I was also about to say is that I was really tentative to, um, <laughs> well, just to to speak about this issue because it's got so much in it. Uh, so, sorry, loonies, you probably hear some silences. It's just It's just probably Connor and myself just re-looking at the, the comic book because um, there's a lot to kind of grasp and... Um, again, like Priest has got so much in here that you just need to kind of <laughs> go back and have a look. Um, but yeah, towards the end there, there's a, um, there's an introduction of, um, what seems to be malice. So Dr. Dr. Voodoo, um, is talking about, uh, he was attacked by someone. So Priest lays another little seed as to what could possibly, you know, um, be told in later issues. And, uh, I think you were mentioning, um... Hunter, Craven. I don't think it's Craven, the Hunter. I think um, that is um, uh, what do you call him? He's the um, the White Wolf. He's Hunter, Hunter the White Wolf. Oh. So yeah. So uh, if you in that parody of um, of Batman, that you see um, in the issue, uh, White Wolf is there with um, it looks like you know. Um, the the parody of the Joker and uh, and Catwoman in there. I'm pretty sure that he's a brother. I think he's a brother, half brother of um of T'Challa. Oh right, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, is it Eric Killmonger? Killmonger? No, no, not not no. Killmonger. Um, let's see. Sorry, Looney's just doing a bit of bit of yeah. investigation here. Let's see, White Wolf, um, Hunter, Marvel. I just let, let's just let Wiki it. I'm pretty sure his name's Hunter. Yeah, there it is. Um, Hunter was adopted. Yeah, that's right. He was adopted by the king of Wakanda, um, uh, T'Chaka, and uh, his name is just Hunter. It hasn't got any other name. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he ends up being the white wolf, which, uh, he's just got a, um, vibranium microweave mesh and cloaking technology with his, uh, with his suit. But, uh, he's also just, uh, um, I think a badass, like pretty, pretty good, <laughs> pretty good fighter. Uh, and he's the, the head of the Hatut, uh, Zarazi, which is like the, um, I think it's featured in, um, in, Tanahisi Coates's run, they're they're kind they're kind of like the the police or the you know the military for for um for Wakanda. Yeah, right. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. So anyway, yeah. Sorry, I just got off off the topic there, but uh, yeah, the uh, <laughs> bargaining by Black Panther was really cool. Yeah, I think um, I just sort of as a. As a point as well, we've covered our first aspects. What do you think of uh, Sal Valuto's art? Oh, yeah. Sal Valuto's art. He's, I just, I loved it more and more um, reading um, the Black Panther priest run. It's just so fantastic. And um, I think I mentioned as well, he actually um, started, he, there's a lot of his work in Mark Spector, Moon Knight. So with, um, with Chuck Dixon uh, writing, you had uh, Sal Valuto on art, and it's very different, actually. So I'm not sure if it's the, um, I'm not sure if, if it is the Inca that actually has, you know, um, really pushed along Sal Valuto's art, but in the Black pa Panther run, it's just, it's just fantastic. What, what do you think of it? Yeah, I really loved it. Um, you know, it's definitely of its time, and like, obviously not my favorite art ever, but like, I think in such a crazy crazy story um it 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 never really confuses you you know there there can be a problem when you um reading art and it's such crazy scenarios jumping between panels paneling can get very messy and very yeah. just sort of you know sometimes confusing and not so much unreadable is just like 
not understandable, but S- Salvaluto really never manages that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's... I think it's I, 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 yeah, yeah, like sort of, you know, of its time, but at the same time, you know, a standout at the time. It's quite brilliant. I think it's really good. Yeah, I, and I think ages ago when... Um, when Into the Night was known as Fist of Conchu, I think I posted, um, if loonies, if you, if you have a look in the group, I think I made like an album of Sal Voluto's art. Um, and yeah, you should just check it out. He's done some really cool things. I think he did Namor as well. And I think he's, um, he's really good with, um, with anatomy, if I can say yeah, that. Yeah, actually. Um, it, it's, it's very, the movements of the characters to me are very fluent. Like, um, not to say that other artists make them all stilted and, and, and stiff, but just with Sal Valuto's art, it just seems that, like, he's got complete control of, um, uh, of, you know, how the body moves. And, um, uh, it just, yeah, it just looks very fluid. Um, and when, you know, people are ripped, like the, the superheroes, they're bloody ripped. <laughs> they, um, you know, the muscles rippling. So, um, yeah, uh, re- really cool art. Um, yeah. What would you, uh, what would you give this, Connor, uh, Crescent Dart rating wise? Um, I think, yeah, I think it's such a, it's such a strong issue. I think this entire run is, you know, don't just read this issue, get yourself a Marvel Unlimited subscription, find the time and read all 62, 70 issues with the crew. It's amazing. Um, there's not much really to complain about. I mean, sometimes, you know, priests can be pretty wordy, and that isn't always attractive to readers. And sometimes even, you know, though I love the run, you know, the uh, the denseness sometimes isn't perfect. Um, I think the issue suffers from a bit of um, uh, colouring issues. I, I, I think the colouring palette isn't quite amazing. I think it can leave itself a bit too, a bit too dark. It's still good, and still especially in the nightmare, but sometimes... It kind of adds, you know, it doesn't quite have that finish or touch that makes it really sort of natural and um, pal- palatable, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's a credible issue. It's obviously in the middle of a story, middle of an arc, you know, as a one-off yeah. issue. You know, it's hard to recommend. But if we're just talking about the brilliance of the nightmare and the spiritual realm, I'm definitely thinking a uh, four out of five crescent dots. Ah. Connor, you beat me. It's, it's, seriously, I was going <laughs> to... Uh, yeah, uh, we must be really on the same wavelength as well. Um, definitely, I um, share what, what you say as well. Uh, but, yeah, I, I enjoy this issue. Um, uh, I'm happy to give it, yeah, like four Crescent Dart ratings because um, although as a one-off, yeah, it, it can be very confusing, um, but having read... The priest, uh, the priest run as well, and kind of knowing how he how he writes and, and tells his stories, uh, it's just quite infectious. Um, so this actually brought back a lot of memories of, oh yeah, this is yeah, this is the um, this is the run that I really loved. So there's a bit of baggage with that, and, and that's why I kind of give it a, a high, um, like four out of five crescent darts because it's quite enjoyable. Um, uh, if we look at you know take another different little spin and if we look at the portrayal of Moon Knight just in the in the issue uh, and if we kind of rate that then I would I would give that slightly less um it's it's not really the Mooney that we kind of know mm, and, and uh, it's not the yeah it's not the kind of the Mooney that uh w- it would interest me like um but you know as as a Black Panther issue it's um and and a priest issue it's really there for four Four Crescent Dart ratings, so, um, yeah, so an average of four. Yeah. <laughs> Easy. Um, yeah, so that, that was a really good pick, Connor. Um, it's such a, such a varied, um, like, such a nice, nice varied issue to, to complement uh, Lemire's uh, issues that we, we, uh, we review. Yeah, it was, it was a nice little mix-up, and I think, um, you know... Sorry about not really having much to talk about in the the fir- in the sort of news section and um sort of you know we kind of did I think but I think you know I think I hope I hope you've enjoyed these uh these two issue reviews I think I've, I think uh, Ray and I have done done pretty well it was it was fun to record yeah. but yeah 
What about a? Uh, Actually, I've got a. Ooh, so, sorry, Connor. There's a the little note here that you got as well. Did you want to explain about about that? I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, uh, uh just for the. Bla- oh yeah, the uh, um, <laughs> the amazing, wonderful, uh, incredible Bat Panther two pager yeah. where inside Everett Ross's dreams, there is just an absolutely unequivocally Batman parody. It, it's yes. Black Panther as Batman with a, you know, it's a, it's it's almost an amalgam character of a, you know, Bat Panther if we could have, or Panther Man in those amalgam yes. comics, and Everett Ross is, you know, unmistakably Robin and um yes, I don't remember. The I name thought that of, was yeah. I don't remember the oh, name. I of thought the it was villain, brilliant. But he's uh, oh, yeah, a, a chip. I can't. A, a chip. I think yes. his name is is the Joker. Same look, yeah. same hat. Yeah. With his little puppet, yeah, and uh, and you got you got uh, Catwoman there, um, who I think she might be one of the Dora Milaje. I'm not sure, um, uh, but she's obviously dressed up as as Catwoman there as well. And then you have the Panther Mobile, um, so or the uh, Akibi's Ducky Mobile. So I thought this was brilliant, um, uh, and it's not actually it's not the first time. Uh, it is done, or it's not. It's not the only time it's done because uh, there's actually a, a Moon Knight issue, Connor, in, in Mark Spector Moon Knight, um, which you get these parodies again um, with how shall I say, The Dark Knight. <laughs> so it's uh, it's definitely fun to see. But this this kind of was a curveball, and it kind of threw me, and I thought it was just really really fun. Yeah, actually, he does a uh, priest does a lot of that in um. His Quantum and uh, Woody one, there's an unused page where uh, Quantum and uh, Woody dress up as a uh, Power Man and Iron Fist. Yes, that's right, that's right. Yeah, Quantum and Woody being, um, just for loonies who may be listening and not aware, is a, a title from Valiant Comics, which is another really good um, publisher, which um, really should be getting more, um, more press and followers, I think. There, there's a lot of really talented artists and writers in there. And as Connor mentioned, um, Christopher Priest did a, a Quantum and Woody run. Uh, and they're very similar, I guess, to uh, Power Man and Iron Fist. So um, I guess the association there was played out in a, in a little bit of a parody. So, um, yeah, that was that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I think that... Uh rounds us out nicely our um our episode so you can tell them what we're expecting next phase our next phase we will be as we've mentioned um wrapping up Lemire's Moon Knight volume 8 run with issue 14 death and birth part 5 of 5 and since um Oh, no, sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> wrong note there. I was about to say something else and that's wrong. No, so part 5 of 5, yep. And uh and We'll also be looking at. I picked this little one shot, Connor. I thought it was oh, really cool. Oh, so and, exciting! <laughs> oh man, the art. I love the art in this and the story. Oh, this is magnifique, Looney's magnifique. <laughs> this is um, Moon Knight Volume Five, Issue Twenty. Um, it's titled "In the Company of Wolves," and it's a one shot. It's um, I believe it's by Mike Benson, um, who who started writing after after Houston, and uh, with phenomenal art by Mike Diodato. So um, definitely check that out if you can before next episode. That's um, Both of them are available, I believe, on Marvel Unlimited. Is the... I better check on it. Is, a, is Lemire's one available on Marvel Unlimited? I don't believe so just yet. Uh, not just yet. Okay, so Looney's, um, you might want to just pick it up from Comixology or, uh... Third Trade's or, out uh, as well. The Third Trade, yeah, exactly. Third Trade or, you know, if you want to get that single issue, go, go for it. It's, uh, I'm sure it's still available somewhere. Uh, but yeah, those two, can't wait to review those. And we'll, again, we'll have a special guest narrator or narrators, um, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> um, but, yeah, can't reveal anything yet, and uh, we'll reveal it um, re- reveal it the next episode. Um, a spectacle, um, Connor. I, th- I guess the big shout-out would be, again, a big thanks to Derek O'Neill from Gotham TV Podcast and Defenders TV Podcast. Um, thank you so much for that 
awesome uh, narrative to both of um, both of the issues reviewed uh, this episode. Uh, anyone else, Connor, you'd like to shout out? Oh, sorry, what was that um, that web page again that you were reviewing? Oh, you, the, you it's um, bigcomicpage.com, just sort of as it said. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah um, Gotham... Uh, Gotham and Defenders boys, both uh, Derek and John, have now done uh, Bare Bones. Their uh, birthdays have been the yes. past weeks. Big happy birthday to the both of them. Ah, uh, yes. Big happy birthday to you guys. And uh, we'll, we'll have to complete the set, Connor. We'll have to try and get Chris on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, really great, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so um, finally, I guess, um, where to find us? Um, look, we're... We're available on email, moonlightpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, our website, which has most of our links to everything, so just check it out, please, on um, www.intothenightpodcast.wordpress.com, and that's where we have our blogs, uh, and we'll have links to all the other stuff um, for you. Uh, it's also where we do our Over the Moon uh, newsletters, which uh, are released... Um, you know, a few days before the podcast, just to get you get your um your mouths watering at the comics to be reviewed. Uh, also, yep. So we're on Facebook, also Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube. Um, just search for Into the Night with a K, um, a Moon Knight podcast, and um, yeah, you should find us. Uh, and finally, sorry, Connor. Oh no, uh, I didn't say oh. anything. No. Oh, okay. Sorry, I got I got a bit of a bit of some feedback there. Might have been a poltergeist. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but finally, um, you can just um, find our podcast on all good podcast catches. So, uh, I myself use Overcast. Uh, how about you, Connor? Which which podcast catcher do you use? I don't actually use any. I usually just like download directly from like uh, Libsyn or something like that or SoundCloud. Ah, I must admit, um, my right. podcast listening is pretty hectic when it comes to my download folder on my phone, actually. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, interesting, because I do see that on um, on the SoundCloud page of ours. Uh, you know, people download stuff as well. So, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I mean, there's also like, you know, Podbean. Um, there's... Are we on Rolf, Acast? Um, Stitcher. Which one? Uh, Acast? Acast? Sorry, that's what's no, called. I'll have to check. Yeah, I still haven't done my um my homework, Connor. I've still got to get us on iHeartRadio. Um, Ooh, okay, <laughs> yes. Yeah, got to do that. But, um, yeah, look, Loonies, we're on, on most of them, so just check us out. Otherwise, head on to SoundCloud and download your fresh copy of the podcast. Anyway, um, any final words, Connor? No, seriously, thank you guys for joining us as always. I hope this episode was as entertaining as always if you've uh, stuck it out for our um episodes i hope i hope this one's kept you on board as well yeah oh definitely for sure it's so much fun doing and thank you so much for listening guys and uh, as, thanks um, to ray for being awesome it's great uh coming each week on here <laughs> oh it's yeah, it's, it's absolute it's an absolute treat as well connor don't worry it's not it's not a one-way traffic it's um <laughs> So much fun doing this and uh, to be able to talk about Moon Knight and, and discuss these issues. It's so fun to actually catch, uh, actually pick uh, particular issues to review. And yeah, just hope um, the loonies uh, out there love it as much as we do. So um, yeah, as uh, we always say, uh, may Conchu watch over the denizens of the night. Goodbye. Catch you later. Moon Knight and affiliated characters, stories and events are properties of Marvel Characters Incorporated. Materials used and discussed within the podcast are intended for critique and review purposes only under the fair dealing concept of the current Copyright Act. The views, information or opinions expressed during the podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the copyright owners.